Good evening, afternoon or morning, and welcome to the Gerald and Judith Porter Lecture. My name is Jill Pfeiffer. I'm president of the AMS, and it is my honor and privilege to introduce Trichette Jackson. Before I do, I want to um, remind you that, that questions for um, Dr. Jackson should be put in the Q&A. You, you can use the chat for, for comments and to say hello to one another or que technical questions. But if you have mathematical questions for the speaker, please use the q and I'll, uh, I'll be monitoring that and I will be able to relay those, those questions at the end of the, of the presentation. Our speaker, Trichette Jackson, earned her PhD in applied mathematics in 1998 from the University of Washington. 10 years later, following postdoctoral positions at the IMA and Duke University, she became a full professor of mathematics at the University of Michigan. Dr. Jackson is an award-winning teacher scholar whose research in mathematical oncology has received international attention. In 2003, she became the second African-American woman to receive the prestigious Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship in mathematics. In 2005, Dr. Jackson received the James S. McDonald 21st Century Scientist Award, and in 2008, Diverse Magazine honored her as one of the year's emerging scholars. In 2010, she became the first woman to receive the Blackwell Tapia Prize, which recognizes a mathematician who has contributed significantly to research and has served as a role model for mathematical scientists and students from underrepresented minority groups. In 2018, she became a member of the inaugural class of Association for Women in Mathematics Fellows and was also featured in the AMS Notices for Women's History Month. Dr. Jackson's research in the field of mathematical oncology is characterized by sophisticated mathematical, statistical, and computational modeling techniques. She's been developing mathematical methods to address critical questions associated with tumor progression and targeted therapeutics. She's built her career on collaborative research and educational activities that cut across traditional disciplinary boundaries. She mentors and publishes papers with undergraduates, masters and PhD students, and is quite simply an inspiration to many of us in the mathematical sciences. Please welcome Trichette Jackson. Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining me from. I'd first like to uh, thank Jill for that all too kind introduction. Um, and I'd also like to try to express what an honor it is for me to have been selected as, to give the, the Porter Lecture. I'm really proud to, to have the opportunity to do this and to share with you a little bit about some ways in which mathematical modeling has been used to try to improve therapeutics for cancer. So I wanted to start with this Time Magazine article. It was actually a cover article, uh, How to Cure Cancer. And when you flipped through the magazine to the actual article, they had this um, pretty striking description of what cancer is. They wrote, Cancer is an intricate and potentially lethal collaboration of genes gone awry, of growth inhibitors gone missing, of hormones and epigenomes changing, and rogue cells breaking free. It works as one great armed force attacking by the equivalent of air, land, and sea in stealth. And we think we're gonna take it out with what? A lab-coated sniper? According to this article, there will not be a lab-coated sniper. They uh, proposed that the hero scientist who defeats cancer will likely never exist. There won't be one person that we can look to as, um, as that person, that sole person who came up with a way to eradicate cancer. Instead of one hero, however, uh, there will be many heroes. So uh, the real point of this article was to sort of share the uh, view that it's going to take a team-based, cross-disciplinary approach uh, to cancer research. And that's what's going to upend tradition and deliver the results we need so badly much, much faster. 
And so in the article, they highlighted, of course, the kinds of expertise um, that needs to come together in order to build these cancer fighting teams. So of course we need biological scientists, we need oncologists, um, they mentioned informaticists, as we know more and more about, about the molecular genetics of cancer, biomedical engineers. And this article, which was written, I don't know, several years ago now, did not include mathematicians or mathematical modelers. So I had to add us in right here because I definitely think we uh, also need a seat at the table to be part of these teams and that we have something to contribute when it comes to um, improving the way that we treat cancer. And I hope to show you some of the ways that um, mathematics can uh, play a role in that in the talk today. Before I do that, I wanna give you another reason why it's gonna take a, a team of heroes and not just one hero. Um, one of those reasons is because cancer is not one disease, right? So cancer is the name that we have given to over 200 genetically different diseases, right? So even though there are all of these different kinds of cancers, there are some common attributes that solid tumors um, sort of possess as they're progressing. So I wanted to go over those really quickly. Um, first of all, mutation acquisition and cellular transformation happens when tumors are initiate, initiated or begin to form. So a normal cell may acquire a series of mutations that makes that cell act a little differently than it should. And um, it continues to grow, it doesn't die when it should, et cetera, and forms a, a mass that we call a tumor. Now that tumor that has been formed in that way um, can only reach a very small size um, because it's being fed by the blood vessels that were already present in the tissue of origin. So another very uh, important step in the progression of most solid tumors is called the angiogenesis. And all that means is the formation of new blood vessels from your existing blood vessel supply. And this is important for cancers because without um, a connection to new blood vessels, this new tissue wouldn't have the uh, nutrients, oxygen, et cetera, that it would need to grow. So uh, cancers initiate this process of blood vessel formation that allows the cancer uh, growing tumor sort of to connect to our highway of blood vessels. And once that happens, cells can begin to move and invade and actually enter blood vessels and uh, reside in the circulation for a little while until they decide to leave the circulation in a new site and form a metastasis or a new tumor at, a, at, a, at another location. So these kinds of characteristics um, are um, commonly seen in almost all solid tumors. Um, so even though we have different genetics and molecular details for how tumors grow, these four kinds of features are almost all, always present as they progress. Now, what's interesting about that is even and if you take a look at all four of those different processes, and if you wanted to answer questions about any of them, you quickly find out that each of those four processes um, has a, a, a complex nature all of its own. So cancer really is a complex dynamical system. Uh, we can talk about single molecules and how that impacts protein interactions. Those protein interactions lead to a whole bunch of intracellular signaling that tells our individual cells what to do and how to behave. And um, that leads uh, to changes in populations of cells. And when whole populations of cells begin to um, act independently or to, to, to um, make decisions that are uh, different than, than they should, that can impact a single organ or a whole organ system and eventually the whole organism. So we've got all of these biological scales um, associated with each of those progression steps in the development of a, of a, of a tumor and, a, and tumor metastases. What's interesting is that mathematical modelers have been interested in questions about cancer at each of these kinds of scales. Um, and depending on what the particular question is and what particular scale um, you're looking at, different types of mathematics has been used. So something from uh, Partial differential equations might be necessary depending on what scale of the question you're asking. Ordinary differential equations, people have used cellular automata or agent-based models to answer certain questions, molecular dynamics models to answer certain questions. Um, 
And it all depends uh, on what scale you're interested um, in looking at. What's going on today in cancer research and mathematical oncology is that people are really interested in a more systems type of approach, where instead of just looking at one scale, we're looking at the integration across these scales. So for me, in my research, I typically look at signaling uh, networks and sort of the signaling uh, that goes wrong inside cancer cells, leading single cells to make the wrong decision that uh, eventually leads to the population level results that we see in terms of a growing tumor. And you'll notice that uh, it, looking at the mathematics on this side, the boundaries are a little bit shaded because when you are looking across scales, there may be situations where you have to use a variety of different mathematical approaches to now address these questions. So there are times when you need to have uh, hybrid approaches that may use single cell agent-based models coupled with partial differential equations or coupled with ordinary differential equations in order to answer the types of questions um, that are arising in cancer uh, research and cancer biology today. So I have just described cancer as a very complex dynamical system that cuts across all kinds of biological scales. However, when data comes in, this is typically what we see. We get data that shows us how the tumor is growing, so the tumor size over time. And almost always we get the same shape for how tumors grow over time. No matter what cancer we're looking at, um, these are on a log scale down here, but the, the shape of the growth curve almost always looks the same. So let's start there with historical or classical models of tumor growth that we're just looking at can we find a formula that will fit that shape of a growth curve that we always seem to see when we're looking at tumor size as a function of time? So um, the classical tumor growth models have their historical roots in the work of a person by the name of Benjamin Gompertz. The interesting thing was he didn't care about cancer. He wasn't interested in cancer at all but his models have now been used successfully, I might add, um, uh, to characterize a vast amount of tumor growth data today. So I, I wanna start here with a historical view of this, walk you through this model derivation, and then show you how it was used to actually change the way uh, we think about treating cancer. So to, to get uh, the Gompertz growth uh, model, we have to go back to thinking about what he was thinking about. Um, he was looking to improve and maybe simplify calculations of human mortality rates. And this was back in the 1800s. So his question of interest was how the number of people alive in certain age ranges depends on their age. So if we have the number of living people and we give that a variable L and we have their age, we give that a variable X. He was basically interested in the rate of change of the number of living people. They may age into this particular age bracket he's looking into. And then the very simplest assumption is they, they may die while in that age bracket, All right? So this is sort of a, a word equation that characterizes the question that he was kind of interested in answering. The key question, however, is how did he go from this word equation? So how did he translate this problem from words to a mathematical statement of balance or a conservation law? So what he did was pour through uh, human life tables and he started looking through them and he observed that um, after a certain age, these life tables showed several different patterns. And so he, he figured out what the patterns were. I'm gonna go through just a couple of them. Um, one pattern that he saw was that in some cases, and by that I just mean age ranges, the rate that people die did not change with age. So for this particular age range, um, the death rate was constant. So that was easy to, to fit into his uh, word equation, right? So we've got the rate of change of the number of people living in a particular age range. They age up into that bracket and then they die at some constant rate, okay? So he could answer his question, which was how, what, how uh, do we know how many people are going to be alive in that age range? Well, it's going to decrease exponentially. A, a simple solution to this equation is just an exponential decay. Another pattern he saw was a little bit different. 
In other cases or other age ranges, the life tables imply that the death rate has to increase with age. So we can no longer have that constant death rate. We have to replace that with what the data suggested to him, which was some sort of exponential increase in death rate. So we replace that constant death rate with an exponential increase in death. So now people in this age range were dying faster um, as they got older. So what happens to the number of living people with this new assumption or with, with uh, this new characterization of the death rate? Well, the decrease in the number of people alive seems to start off pretty close to an exponential, but eventually it begins to decrease much faster than exponential. And this result has actually been shown to be pretty good um, for certain age ranges, particularly the age window between 30 and 80 years of age. So you might be asking about this point, we're several slides into the Gompertz growth law, which I said has been used for tumor growth and all we've been talking about is death. So how do we go from this interesting idea of death rate increasing as a function of age to something that has to do with cancer or tumors? Well, all we have to really do is switch the way we're thinking about it. So instead of thinking about the number of people um, uh, the death rate of people increasing with time or with age, we could think about cancer cells or a population of cells whose growth rate now decreases with time. So we've just switched our, our way of thinking about this. And when you do that and you write down an equation for the net growth of a population of cells, cancer cells, if you will, and you assume that that net growth rate is decreasing with time, exponentially, you get the Gompertz tumor growth law or a population growth law. And a medical oncologist by the name of Larry Norton conducted some of the first wide ranging experiments that looked to see if this kind of growth law could actually really fit a vast amount of data from uh, different kinds of cancers. And he found that it definitely could. So what we get from this is that the net tumor growth rate de decays exponentially over time, which implies that smaller tumors are going to grow faster than larger ones. So we've got this formula now, we can so actually solve this analytically. You get a nice formula that fits all kinds of tumor growth data. How can we take this type of formula, this knowledge that most tumors have this growth curve and use it to say something about therapy or treatment of cancer? Well, it turns out you can do that. And Norton and one of his colleagues did. First thing to know is that the rate of killing by a lot of chemotherapeutic agents is proportional to tumor growth rates. So it's not that um, surprising to think that smaller tumors are more easily eradicated with chemotherapeutic drugs than larger ones, right? So that's kind of what this is saying. But the, the Norton-Simon hypothesis goes in a step further and says that if tumors are given less time to regrow between treatments, then you have a better chance of eradicating them. So this is a mathematical modeling based hypothesis. And here pictorially is what that means. Say you have some reference protocol for how you wanna deliver chemotherapy. Maybe it's once every three weeks at a certain dose level given by the red bar. Now, many people at this time were thinking maybe if we gave more drug, a dose intense protocol. So increase the amount of drug we give every three weeks, we could do better. What the Norton-Simon hypothesis says is that you can give the same amount of drug, but give it uh, more frequently. So a dose dense protocol, and you should be able to do better than either of these um, other treatment uh, rationales. So that was a, a, a really eye-opening um, sort of hypothesis uh, in the community at the time, and it had to be proven or validated. And so they set about doing that. They did an actual clinical trial to validate this hypothesis. They tested standard of care dosing regimes for particular chemotherapeutic on patients, and they tested the dose-dense regime on, on uh uh, clinical trial patients. And um, in all of the cases, they improved the survival among the trials participants when they gave the dose dense regime. So, and this is just a look at what you might expect. So here's the cell number over time. 
the green arrows here tell us when we're going to give the, the standard regimen. And you see that the tumor does have some time to regrow between treatments. If you look over time, you might get um, some decrease in, in the tumor uh, cell number. But if you gave a dose dense regimen, right? So the tumor has less time to regrow and they actually did much, much better um, in terms of eradicating the tumor when they gave the drug according to this dose dense uh, theory. So that's just, that's our first example. And it's a pretty good one, right? A, a, a pretty big one about how um, using mathematical knowledge, a mathematical formulas can lead to actually improvements in how we treat patients with cancer. So this dose dense idea is still around today and is still used in, in some cases. So the question becomes, why should we ever improve on this Gompertz model? It seems pretty great. It matches a lot of data. Um, it led to this hypothesis that was validated for how to, to deliver chemotherapy. Is there a need to, to do a little better than that? Well, my answer is to that question is yes. And the reason is because when you think about it, is there anything really that special about the Gompertz idea? Um, any flexible mathematical formula that can give generate this S-shaped type of curve would probably do pretty well at fitting a lot of this data as well. And so people have tested all kinds of different um, formulas that can give the same shape of curve and they fit the data just as well as the Gompertz equation, right? So maybe there are other reasons we should think about improving on Gompertz. Another reason would be that when you think about it, the, the rationale behind it was just simply based on observation that the tumor's net growth rate decreases over time. But there was no clear biological mechanism incorporated in that model that shows why that should be the case, right? So why should that be the case? Or um, there are no mechanisms that would produce this exponential decline other than just placing an exponential there. So models like this, we call phenomenological models, and they kind of um, try to describe relationships in kind of general terms, and with the assumption that these relationships can be generally ap applied across the board. Trends today, in cancer modeling are to take a more mechanistic approach. And that's the kind of approach that I take. Um, so I build models that have a structure that explicitly represents our understanding of the biological, chemical, and or physical processes um, associated with tumor growth. So these types of mechanistic models really are trying to quantify phenomena by describing their underlying mechanisms. So that's my reason for thinking that we may want to improve on Gompertz. So I want to take you through some of my own research um, that kind of will walk you through what a mechanistic model might look like and how models like these can also help to improve um, the way we think about treating cancer. Um, the title here says targeting cancer stem cells. I'm going to tell you what all of that means. Um, but first, I have to highlight the fact that as a mathematician working in this area, it's really critically important for me to um, work with experimental collaborators who are collecting data at all of these various scales um, of biology that can um, sort of calibrate and validate the types of models that we're developing. So my experimental collaborators work on head and neck cancers, okay? So this is the name given to um, several cancers uh, in the head and neck area. They're the sixth most common cancer worldwide. 95% of them are called squamous cell carcinomas. And so these are the kinds of cancers I'm gonna be talking about today. So why do we need to do better? Well, the prevalence of these types of cancers is increasing while the five-year survival rates are remaining the same, completely static over the last 30 years. So we really, it's really um, important that we figure out how to treat these head and neck cancers better. We're seeing them more often, right? So the standard of care for these types of cancers is a, is a particular kind of chemotherapy. 
And um, the question becomes, what do you do when the hallmark of medical treatment, this chemotherapy, fails? What are your options when what's supposed to work is not working? One answer is to consider targeted therapeutics. So as you know, chemotherapies typically attack rapidly dividing cells. Cancer cells aren't the only cells in your body that divide rapidly. And so there are lots of side effects with chemotherapy. Targeted therapies are a little bit different in that these are drugs designed to interfere with specific cells, enzymes, proteins, uh, signaling molecules that we know are necessary for the growth and progression of a particular type of cancer. So now um, re uh, researchers will be able, are being able to understand the molecular drivers of specific cancers. And we can use that information to target specific um, uh, to find specific targets for um, the various cancers that we're interested in. So I have cells, specific cells, um, bold and in red, because the targeted therapy we're going to look at today is aimed at a specific type of cell that is growing along uh, with, with the uh, bulk tumor cells. And we're going to talk about what that particular type of cell is in just a minute. So another difference between targeted therapy and the traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy is that you can actually get a little bit more precision. We're not just indiscriminately um, targeting cells that are dividing, right? So we have some more precision and that can also lead to potentially fewer side effects. So some reasons to think about targeted therapy when, when standard of care fails. So what cells are we going to target? Well, uh, we're going to target a type of cell known as a cancer stem cell. I'm going to call them CSCs for the, for the rest of the talk. Um, some things to know about these particular cells. They are drivers of growth in a variety of cancers, including the head and neck cancers that my collaborators work on. When they are present in a tumor, they are a small fraction of that tumor, right? So they're the minority. They're the minority, but, they're, but in a lot of senses, they are the most important cells in that tumor. Why? Because they can self-renew. They can cre create unlimited numbers of themselves. They are tumorigenic. They're the ones who can, uh, th these are the cells that are capable of forming new tumors. They are also able to differentiate into other uh, types of cells responsible for tumor progression. So if you have a cancer stem cell here, um, it can give rise to more of itself along with progenitor cells, other types of cancer cells that are gonna um, continue to grow and divide. And also importantly, the small fraction of cells which are the key drivers are often always the most difficult to treat. They can be resistant, resistant to a lot of the types of therapies that are standard of care, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, um, and things like that. So this is a very important population um, within, the, within the tumor. So based on this uh, kind of hierarchy we just talked about, these, the small number of driver cells that uh, generate more of themselves along with more of other types of cells within the tumor gives us a, a, a real heterogeneous mix of cells within a tumor. So tumors resulting from cancer stem cells contain a mix of cells, right? So we've got the, the cancer stem cells and then all of their progeny, which have different properties. And that's kind of important to know. So what does this have to do with therapy? How can, how can targeting these particular cells perhaps aid with a therapeutic approach? Well, let's first think about a traditional therapeutic approach, maybe a chemotherapeutic drug. So those drugs are targeting or aimed at cells that are rapidly dividing. There's lots of those cells in the tumor. So you may have a chemotherapeutic regime that um, actually, or a regimen that actually eliminates a lot of the rapidly dividing tumor cells. However, remember we said this, this cancer stem cell population is also a difficult population to treat with chemotherapeutic drugs. So you will likely leave those driving cells behind. So if you were looking at a plot of tumor cells versus time after a conventional therapeutic approach, you would see what you wanted to see, a reduction in the number of tumor cells. So it would look very good. 
However, if you've left these, this driving population of cells behind, what you would expect is recurrence um, and in short order, probably, um, uh, the cancer would likely recur because these cells are able to completely begin the process again of making more of themselves and making more of the other types of cells within the tumor. So this new approach, which is targeting these driver cells, these cancer stem cells, would have a different a look to it. So now you would give a therapy that would eliminate a very small proportion of the tumor. So if you looked at a graph of tumor cell number versus time, it wouldn't look very good. You haven't really um, reduced the tumor by much if you've eliminated this small fraction of cancer stem cells. However, if you waited and looked later over time, if you eliminated all of these driver cells, the rest of the cells aren't capable of generating new tumors and they would eventually die off. And so you would uh, lead to cancer regression. Tumor regression is the hope. Okay, so that's the difference between these two approaches. Approaches. All right, so now we're gonna look at the impact of chemotherapy, which is our standard of care on the stem cell population. So the stem cell population are the drive, they're the driver cell driver cells, remember. So they're very important. So what happens when we give chemotherapy? Well, first of all, recurrence occurs in almost 50% of patients. Um, so that's like I showed here, eventually you're going to get recurrence. And that's exactly what happens with these head and neck cancer patients when they're given uh, chemotherapy typically. So what's going on? Well, evidence shows, so my collaborators, collaborators have found that the chemotherapy actually increases the um, replication of the cancer stem cell uh, population. So not only is chemotherapy killing off the, 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 the least lethal cells within the tumor, it is enhancing uh, the most lethal cells within the tumor, the driver cells. So what this is showing is, and this is kind of how they saw that, they implanted humor to, human tumors in a mouse. Uh, they let, that, uh, let the cancer form and grow. They gave the chemotherapeutic drug and then they counted um, the number of uh, cancer stem cells when they didn't give any treatment versus when they did. So when they didn't give any treatment, there was a certain fraction of cancer stem cells, very small fraction. And when they actually treated with a chemotherapeutic drug, the fraction of those driver cells was actually substantially increased. Um, so that's having a very negative effect on what's going on with the, with the tumor. So how are we gonna figure out how to target them? We, now we see we definitely need, we need to target them um, because when you give chemotherapy, there's even more of them, right? So how can we figure out what a good target will be? So um, the way they did this was to take a look at where they live and what they do. So what they found, so this is an actual experiment, experimental um, slide showing in red a cancer stem cell, uh, next to a blood vessel. So these are red cancer stem cells next to blood vessels. The schematic may be a little bit easier to, to see. So we've got this blood vessel and we've got a tumor growing. Um, the, the purple cancer stem cells seems to be the ones that are closest to blood vessels. So these cancer stem cells live close to blood vessels and some things that the blood vessel cells are secreting are helpful to the stem cells and it helps them maintain um, all of their special properties. So now we've figured out it's a, depending on where they live, um, these stem cells are, have a higher probability of uh, re retaining their special properties. So they found out that not only do they live near, near blood vessels, but ke chemical signals from the blood vessels are um, sort of stimulating these cells. So maybe these chemicals that the blood vessel cells are secreting could be the target that we need, right? So these chemicals should be um, what we aim to uh, eliminate. So blood vessel cells are producing a certain chemical. And if we can block that chemical from acting on the stem cells, then we have um, hopefully uh, found a way to um, uh, reduce or potentially eliminate that stem cell driver cell pool. So that's the goal. 
And just to show you that there are therapies that do that. So this is looking at a particular uh, targeted therapy against those chemicals that the blood vessel cells are secreting. And it's showing that um, before treatment, the, the percent of stem cells is um, quite high. After treatment, we can reduce that. And in vitro just means they, they did this first in a culture dish. And then in vivo, they did this in a living animal and got even better reduction after therapy. So the type, the targeted therapy um, actually did work, right? So you did, it did its job of sort of decreasing the stem cell pool. All right, so here's where the mathematical modeling comes in. We know that the standard of care, which was a chemotherapeutic drug, I'm gonna call it cis for cisplatin, that's the name of the drug, and the targeted therapy, which we just saw some evidence of, I'm gonna call that one TCZ, they're kind of affecting the stem cell pool, the special cells, these driver cells, they're affecting them in opposing directions. The chemotherapy is actually increasing the stem cells and the targeted therapy is decreasing the, the stem cells. So we, what we wanna do is use mathematical modeling to propose uh, a rational schedule for combining these two drugs, right? So the chemotherapy is a, is, is a very um, uh, a good approach because it's a high cell killing therapy, right? Um, so that we have to come behind it with uh, a targeted therapy in order to reduce the number of stem cells which the chemotherapy has now increased. So that's the idea. Right, so conventional therapies killing off all of the bulk cells and we get relapse. Cancer stem cell therapy is um, leading to a much slower regression. Combination therapy, we hope will do the trick, right? All right, so my group has been um, developing mathematical models of these types of targeted therapies for a long time. Um, the models themselves incorporate um, information across those biological scales that I talked to you about early on in the talk. Um, so we've got some, I said, we, we typically look at signaling. So we have our cell signaling cascades. Um, we look at how that impacts individual cell decisions. So we've got blood vessel cells we know are um, creating some chemicals and we've got tumor cells we know are growing. So we look at how these signaling cascades impact individual cells and then translate that to the information we see about the populations of cells, kind of what we do. So let's just take a quick look at some of what this modeling might look like in its very, very simplest form. Okay, what do we want to do? We want to develop a general strategy for linking the intracellular signaling pathways that we know are critical for the cells to decide whether they're gonna divide, that's proliferation, whether they're gonna die, that's apoptosis, whether they're gonna move, right? And receptor ligand binding on the surface that leads to these intracellular signaling cascades. So something has to uh, trigger those signaling cascades. Um, and then we wanna translate that to the population level growth dynamics that we get that data for. The data remembers usually just tumor growth versus time. So, but we know that all of these underlying factors are sort of um, leading to that particular type of growth. All right, so the strategy just says, what if we consider a, a growth uh, uh, molecule A that binds to some receptor on, a, on the surface of a cell and a, forms a complex. So in order for the cell to decide what to do, it, it gets cues from its environment. There might be some sort of growth factors floating around in the environment. Those growth factors are going to bind to receptors on the surface of the cell and cause a whole signaling cascade that lets the cell know what to do. In this case, what the cell does is decide to divide and it decides that it should live a little bit longer. So it increases uh, survival and increases proliferation, okay? So we wanna write down some equations that kind of incorporate this kind of knowledge. So instead of just saying the tumor growth rate decreases exponentially with time, we're gonna include some of the factors that we know are at play that govern tumor cell division and tumor cell survival or tumor cell death. So we have a, at the population level, we might talk about our cancer cells, just like uh, Gompertz, uh, just like the Gompertz growth model did. But now we're going to have the drivers of the cancer cell growth be um, the molecular level details of uh, growth factors. 
And then survival uh, will be at an intracellular level, the proteins that tell cells to survive. And then we can connect these different scales. We've got the population scale, we've got the cell scale, we've got the intracellular scale. We can connect them by looking at the fraction of bound complexes, the signaling complexes on the surface of cells. So that's, our, that's the way we connect to these two scales. So just to show you what we've got, how we're differing from gohm perts that just says um, the tumor growth rate decays exponentially in time, we are now writing down explicit formula for what the growth rate is, what the death rate is, and how they depend on the molecular level details. So there may be some in intrinsic growth rate, but then molecular details of the environment enhance that growth rate. There may be some uh, sort of inherent death rate, but then molecular details inside the cell uh, mediate whether that uh, death rate uh, increases or decreases. And so we wanna keep track of all of those things. Our story gets just a tad more complicated because we don't just have one cell, cell type, right? We've got stem cells that give rise to other cell types. So we expand that just a little bit with, some, with, with additional equations to make sure we capture the hierarchy of cancer stem cell driven growth. Now, I said uh, it was really important to have data to sort of inform and calibrate these models. And we do have data at different scales. I'm only showing you some of the, the data that we kind of use to uh, calibrate these models. So we have data uh, for tumor cell growth under a variety of different conditions. And then we also have pharmacokinetic data for how both of our drugs work. So we have a chemotherapeutic agent and we have that targeted agent. So we have to include all of this kinds of, uh, these kinds of data uh, in the model um, to make sure that it's going to um, match reality well. So let's just look at some results. Um, what we're looking here again, like we said, most of the data we get is tumor size, tumor volume versus time. Um, the black is control, no, no treatment. And then um, the green here, we're looking at delivering a targeted therapy, the targeted therapy against the stem cells that we talked about on two different starting days. And so what we did was calibrate the model to the uh, um, control case where no therapy was given. And then we directly compare our model to what happens when we give therapy. We don't fit the model to data. We don't constrain the model by data anymore. All we do is overlay our simulation with the data. So this is just a direct comparison that we're using as our validation step. And so our model was accurately kind of predicting what we would expect in the tumor reduction um, for targeted therapy. And then we make some predictions about what the stem cell pool would look like. So without treatment, what the stem cell pool would look like. And again, um, and this was a, a situation where you started with cancer stem cells to generate the tumor and the stem cells fall to some uh, steady state level. However, under treatment, we get far fewer stem cells. And that's what we expect to happen because we are targeting that particular population. We can do the same thing if we just look at chemotherapy now. So if we just look at the chemotherapy data, we've got, um, again, no treatment in black, and then what the model says should happen along with the data when you give chemotherapy, and this was just two different starting days. The predictions here show the stem cell percentage now after um, these therapies. So again, as we, as we sort of said, um, the, the chemotherapy actually increases the stem cell pool, right? So we, and, and this graph just shows the, the relative increase. So you can get a real picture. We've got like, in some cases, near 30% increase in the stem cell pool after you give the standard of care chemotherapy, right? So what does the model say and the data say when you give both therapies? Well, combination therapy we see if we just, so here again, control, no treatment, and then blue, we have combination therapy. Again, direct comparing our model to the data. We're not fitting the model to this data any longer. We are just overlaying our model with uh, the, the experimental time points and we get a good agreement. Um, but the prediction that we make is that this combination therapy can more than counter a Act the effects that that chemotherapy had, which was increasing the stem cell pool by over by about 30%. Now we, we are back to that reduction that we wanted to see. So right now we have trained the model, we have validated the model. 
what we really want to use the model for is to say something, and optimizing here is a strong word, what we really want to do is to figure out uh, a dosing strategy that may um, improve the way we give these two drugs together. Okay, so model has been developed, it has been calibrated, and it has been validated. So now let's see what we can use the model to, to predict in terms of how best to deliver these two drugs. What do we want to do exactly? We want to minimize the amount of targeted therapy required for a fixed amount of chemotherapy. We phrased it this way because chemotherapy is standard of care. They know exactly how much they're going to give uh, and when. Um, and so we want to give as little targeted therapy as required for that fixed dose of chemotherapy. At the same time, we want to maximize the re um, reduction in the tumor cell number and the reduction in the stem cell pool, because those are the most uh, uh, lethal cells in terms of regenerating tumors. We also want to, and how, how do we want to do this? Well, we want to try to do this by changing when and how often we administer the two drugs with respect to each other. So can we change the order or timing and get a better result is the question. Okay, so we're gonna look here at a couple of different administration schedules. So for the targeted therapy, we're gonna give it weekly for three, four or five weeks. And for the chemotherapy, we can give it before the targeted therapy. We can give it at the same time as the targeted therapy, or we could give it after the targeted therapy. And um, the chemotherapy is, highly, uh, chemotherapy is highly cytotoxic, so it's only given for two or three weeks, okay? So let me just walk you through some of the things that we were interested in um, looking at. So let me walk, this table is a little uh, daunting, so let me walk you through it. What we're looking at uh, with the numbers here on the left are just different um, trials for pre-treating, co-treating, or post-treating -treat with the chemotherapy. Um, when you see a gray shaded box, that's where we gave the uh, we gave the targeted therapy. Where you see the word cis, that is for our cisplatin, our chemotherapy. Um, and so let's just look at, for example, uh, row three. This is saying that we co-treated, we gave cisplatin with targeted therapy uh, for three weeks, right? Down here, we gave targeted therapy for four weeks. And down here, we gave targeted therapy for five weeks. And you can see we either pre-treated, we co-treated, and in some cases we post-treated with the cisplatin, with the, with the chemotherapy. And then we looked at all of our metrics to see um, whether or not we were actually reducing the stem cells like we wanted to, whether there was any synergy going on between the two drugs, and whether we were actually giving, giving a small amount of the targeted therapy or not. So if we just look down a couple of these rows for synergy, what we're looking for is a number less than one um, to show some sort of synergistic effects. Just scanning down these columns, I see nothing less than one. We got no synergistic interactions with these kinds of dosing schedules just pre, co post, or co-treating um, with the drugs. And we also saw that the stem cell reduction, the percentage of stem cell reduction in this column didn't change much either. Um, but we could say that it looked like co-treatment was sort of preferred over the other two other, other cases just because we got more stem cell reduction when we co-treated. So this was a little disappointing. So these are the dosing schedules we were, we were kind of asked to sort of play around with. We didn't get any synergy and we didn't get much change in the um, percentage of stem cell reduction. So we started, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, we've already talked about what all those things mean. Um, so what we really wanted to do is see under what conditions can we really get better results. So we threw caution to the wind and really started playing around with different kinds of dosing strategies where we actually space out the doses. Instead of giving the doses together, maybe we give uh, a chemotherapeutic drug, have a week off, give it again, have a week off, uh, things like that. We wanted to play around with different dosing strategies. And what we found is if you did that, we found our first instance of synergy for the first time we were able to get um, a, a, a number less than one for our... Uh, a scheduling index representing some synergy. Um, and then we looked, we could even do better, right? So if we did certain uh, dosing regimes, we could get a lot of synergy happening and we're giving way less drug. We're giving so much less um, 
of the targeted therapy than we were in the other uh, other slide as well. So we're doing so much be better um, if we space out doses. Um, that led to improved synergy and the need for less drug. So it's one of the, the kinds of things that the mathematical model helped us to see. So I'm just gonna begin to summarize here. Um, what I hope to show you today was kind of like a historical example of how mathematical thinking or mathematical modeling led to some interesting insights into how we can deliver uh, therapeutics better. And then I've also hoped to show you a little taste of kinds of the kinds of models that we've been developing um, that operate across scales now that incorporate mechanistic levels of detail um, in order to do kind of the same thing, try to improve the way we give drugs. The model that I showed you um, is able to capture mechanism of action of these targeted therapeutics and of standard of care therapeutics. Um, and I think that's really important. And, and it's able to, when you have that level of mechanistic detail, you can look at um, the impact of the crosstalk between um, the cancer cells and the blood vessel cells. And you can figure out how to interrupt that discussion between the two in order to um, uh, have more effective therapies. Um, so we showed you just a method of uh, testing out diff different dosing strategies, and we found ways to really improve uh, the synergy of the two of the two kinds of therapies and of the two drugs. So quickly, I'd just like to thank my collaborators on this. So um, Fareshta Nazari, a former graduate student of mine, Alexandra Okaleas, um, uh, a former um, PhD student of my collaborator, uh, Alexander Pearson, who's now at the University of Chicago, and Jacques Noor, who's also at the University of Michigan. So thank you for your time. Um, I'm happy to take a look at the Q&A and see if there are any questions. I think I'll stop sharing my screen now and try to take a, take a look. That was a beautiful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I see that there are a few questions. If you don't mind, I'll. I, I um, the, someone. The, the first one is to a, a clarification on the big table of treatments. Was that modeling results or the or clinical results that you were showing? Oh, there? thank you. Good question. So those were the modeling predictions. The big table that was a little daunting to look at was us running simulations. Um, so we, we felt pretty good with the model being validated that we could um, sort of run it for a lot of different test simulations or trials to see what um, changing the order of uh, giving these drugs would do. And so that table was just all of our different, uh, actually that was just a fraction of our different runs testing different uh, order and timing of the two drugs. Great, thank you. And and just to a couple of quick follow ups on that. How how do you measure syn synergy? So the um, it, synergy is measured through uh, what we call a scheduling index. It's a ratio of the IC70, which was the amount of the targeted therapy needed to induce seventy percent reduction of um, of the cancer. Um, uh, a ratio of that number to uh, for the baseline schedule, which is co-treatment to each of the other treatment schedules. So we look um, at co-treating with both drugs. We figure out how much drug we need uh, to reduce the tumor by 70%. And then we change the way we give those drugs. And we look at that same number and, and get the ratio of those two. Thank you. And so now that now that you've shown some some improvement in synergy and also the number of uh, stem cells with this uh, spaced dosing uh, strategy, what has there? What, what are the next steps? Is it being great question? Is it, is it in clinical trials or yeah, is it great question? Not treatment? quite yet. <laughs> that, yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, not quite ready for clinical trials yet. The next step for us. So we're my models are almost all preclinical. And so the next step for this and uh, is to be, is for our um, preferred dosing strategy to be tested in mice. And so they are growing um, the mice um, and, a, and a, the tumors in the mice in a certain way to begin to test out um, the mathematical model predicted um, best strategy. So that's the next step. If that really works, then there are many, many more steps <laughs> before we ever get to humans. But but um, the the potential is definitely there. Right. So this would be what you would call phase one trials or 
this is actually still preclinical, preclinical. Pre preclinical trials. Yeah. All right. Uh, so so you've, you've had some remarkable success in modeling for, for these head and neck cancers. And, uh, you know, some people in the audience are curious whether they're, you know, they're being, these ideas are going to be, are in the process of being used or going to be used for other types of cancers as well. Oh, so that's a, that's a really good question. So the models that we build, the frameworks that we build are very flexible. Um, what connects them to head and neck cancer really are mostly the parameter values. So with data and parameter values for a different type of cancer, we could certainly adapt our, our structure very easily to other, other targeted drugs for other cancers in other settings. So yeah, it's a very flexible framework. And to go back to a qu question or comment that was made early on, <clears throat> Uh, one of the audience members wrote, I, I heard that on average, a human body produces a cancer cell every day. So, so that brings up, you know, the question, you know, from, from, you know, there's, there's one or two cells that your body can, can deal with. And then suddenly it, there's a tipping point, it's out of control. Have you done any sort of modeling or thinking about that sort of tipping point and, and, and what that might, what that, you know, how to model that and think about that? Yeah, that's another great question. And I have um, thought about that a little in the past and I've started to rethink about it a little bit more, more recently um, because the immune system plays such a key role in that. The immune system is our first line of defense against um, uh, the, the, a newly forming cancer. And so trying to figure out under what circumstances the immune system is able to eliminate or um, a tumor or whether a tumor is able to escape the immune system is a really big question. There's been some modeling um, done along that line. And um, some of my very latest work is actually looking at immunotherapies, but I'm the kind of person um, who, before I, 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 I wanna incorporate a therapy, I kind of wanna understand what, what, what's going on um, um, pre uh, treatment. So the, the question of when is the immune system beginning to fail and what are what's causing that has been on my mind a lot lately. Look for something in a year or two out from me on that. Yeah, we, we, we sure will. Um, so I, I imagine that, that if this gets to, you know, some clinical trials involving patients, you know, as somebody in the audience said, you're, you're going to have to count cancer stem cells in, in patients. How, how, is, how does one do that? So yeah, that's very tricky and also a little bit controversial because um, the markers are, are there. So there was a particular cancer stem cell marker in this particular work or combination of markers, but um, I guess it's still up in the air about whether everyone agrees on these markers for cancer stem cells. Mm -hmm. So as we understand more about what exactly characterizes a stem cell, um, we'll be able to do a better and better job of that. Uh, right now, there are certain markers that are accepted um, with, you know, a little bit of, you know, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. But um, I think th that we're getting better at, and better at identifying what it means to be a stem cell for a particular type of cancer, but that's still up and coming. And, and someone else is wondering about the, the interactions with other types of therapy like radiation and surgery and whether you're, you're, you're thinking about modeling those kinds of interactions as well. That's a good question. I have not um, done much with um, radiation or surgery. Usually, uh, like I said, most of my work is preclinical. So these are human tumors grown in mice. However, when um, I do talk, my collaborators are um, both clinicians and um, basic scientists. So they actually see patients. And the, the kind of information I get from them is usually after surgery. So after they've done a first rescission of the tumor and they're looking at what's going on after that, um, so I've never really modeled surgery or radiation, but that's something that I could incorporate um, if, if it became you know, necessary to do in the models. Thank you. And some, someone wants a bit of a clarification on, on the improvement in synergy. Was it the periodic administering of cysts that led to improved synergy? Great question. Yeah. So um, it was spacing out the cisplatin mostly that had the effect. 
And so we've been looking into reasons why that might be the case. And so it took us back to looking at the pharmacokinetics of the two drugs. And it turns out that that happened to be pretty important that um, one of the drugs stays around the system a little longer, the other one decays a little bit faster in the system, different is metabolized differently in the system. And uh, playing those two things off of each other is what led to the best synergy, which manifests itself as spacing out the cisplatin doses. Thank you. And then, and then uh, one of our attendees wondered about the numerical parameters that you mentioned. You know, do, do you rely on, on you know, your clinical colleagues to get some of these parameters you know, with the papers that they're publishing from their, their clinical work? Or, I mean, how do you actually get these right parameters, these yeah. parameters right? Another great question. So I have actually been extremely spoiled by my collaborators. Um, and the, 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 uh, the model parameters that you see in, in this work and a lot of my work have come directly from experiments with the same cell lines and the same type of mice. And I didn't have to like figure out how to um, synergize data from a variety of different sources. My collaborators have a lot of information that's been fed directly into, into the, the, this modeling framework. So I, I think we're, we might be out of time if tech support could let me know if there's still a, a couple of moments left. I, I, I think that I could have <clears throat> get to a couple more questions, but um, maybe uh, we'll, we'll try we'll try this one. Even even though you're on the math modeling side of it, do you, do you know what the benefit of the uh, to the body of IL six is, and and you know what are the consequences of turning it off? That's a great question. So IL-6 is super important to the body in a lot of, uh, for a lot of different reasons. It um, is a cytokine that stimulates um, uh, the cells to do a lot of different things. Um, however, in, in normal functioning um, humans, um, targeting it for therapy for, for cancer, it actually, the, the drug that we're using to target it is, is already approved for arthritis. So it targets IL-6 in terms of reducing inflammation for arthritis. So that's why I think they're believing it would be safe to continue in this new uh, direction for this drug. So they know that it's been delivered to humans for other, in other settings without causing any major issues and uh, any major issues. And so now we're just kind of repurposing it um, for the fight against cancer. So I think the safety of this particular way of targeting IL-6 ha has kind of been established from, from other settings. Thank you. And, and another member of our audience wonders about the, the use of targeted therapy without non-targeted therapy. So I, of course, as you said, I mean, chemotherapy that's non-targeted is the standard, you know, the standard treatment, the treatment of choice, and you're working within those parameters. But, yeah, you know, has there been any thought to, to just using targeted therapy? That's a good question. Um, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, uh, targeted therapies are often used in conjunction with uh, other therapies. And I think especially targeting cancer stem cells is still very, very new. Um, and I think the reason behind it for, for, can for the cancer stem cell problem is that you don't get much reduction in the tumor at all um, initially because you're, you're targeting a very small fraction. Even though they're the drivers, you're not seeing that kind of result that you'd want to see, which is that your tumor is shrinking. Um, so giving it together with a cytotoxic drug that's going to give you that um, initial shrinkage of the tumor is kind of how they're, they're, they're typically given. Of course, yes, I, I, I see. Of course, if there are some extremely slow growing cancers, yeah. it might be, um, a, a, might be an opportunity to, to consider Absolutely. just the targeted therapy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, and then early on in your talk, somebody wondered why the, the number of head and neck cancers were, was increasing. Why, why, were, why do, do, do you have any, any idea from your clinical so. colleagues? What, 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 you yeah. know, what are people speculating about this? That is a very, very good question. Um, I believe, and uh, I will double check with them to make sure I haven't led you astray, but um, smoking is a, a major cause of some of these. Uh, vaping is a major cause of, of some of these, you know, inhalants, let's say, uh, of certain kinds are, are uh, more on the rise and we're seeing more 
cancers arising in oral cavities and things that they consider as part of the head and neck. Thank you. Well, so you've, you've, I think you've answered um, just about every question that the audience could throw at you and, and, and did it beautifully. Thank you so much for the talk, for the information afterwards. This was, this was um, uh, very enlightening and, and really inspiring. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you all.